Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to today's webinar on projects arbitration in Romania and Moldova. My name is Matej Purice, and I'm a senior lawyer in the International Arbitration Group of Freshfields, specialized in um, global projects disputes, both commercial and under international investment protection treaties. I am a Romanian national with strong Moldovan roots, so it is my pleasure to introduce and moderate to today's discussions. So just to start, what is project arbitration? Essentially, it is an area of practice that focuses on disputes arising out of major projects, including infrastructure, energy, oil and gas, mining, as well as, well as general construction projects, including buildings or wider urban developments. It is one of the areas that our international arbitration team at Freshfields focuses on globally. Uh, so why this particular topic today? I think there are perhaps three main reasons. First, uh, and I don't like to start with a negative one, but as you may perhaps expect, the, the first one is linked to the impact of the COVID-19 pandemic on the construction sector uh, widely in the world. It is an unfortunate reality that the pandemic hit the construction and infrastructure sectors at a time when in several markets, um, they were already economically strained. We have, been, we have seen rather in the past year, a number of projects either suspended or canceled for lack of financing, difficulties in the supply chain or workforce issues, as well as a number of well-established global contractors defaulting on their payment obligations or loans. This trend suggests a gloomy year ahead, but we expect to see an increase in the number of disputes arising out of projects affected by the global pandemic uh, across uh, the world. Now, moving to a more positive uh, reason, um, which is linked to the significant effort worldwide towards energy transition and the expectation there um, that the construction sector will be the key, uh, will be a key one in delivering that transition uh, and taking economies across the world out of the current slump. Finally, a welcome change in the growth of the construction sector, particularly in Romania. And um, on that, uh, you will see on the first slide um, one reality, if, if I can call it that, that, that happened in the last year. Um, while at the European Union level, the construction sector recorded a negative growth rate um, compared to 2019, Romania cham championed with the most significant positive growth rate uh, across Europe and one of the only three countries in the European Union with a positive growth rate. And so that is uh, an impressive result. And you can see here on this slide a, a, a few um, uh, numbers and trends uh, for the Romanian market. And um, what I thought was interesting to, to, to see is the index of, um, of, of index for the construction works in Romania uh, last year. And you can see there an interesting, an interesting change in that there is a decrease in the number of uh, general maintenance works and capital repairs but there is a, cons a considerable increase in the, um, as, um, for new construction projects. And we think that is consistent with the wider efforts at state level to push for uh, major infrastructure projects across the country, especially in the roads and rail sector, as well as in the energy sector. And the, the registered growth that we've seen coupled with the fact that the World Bank included Romania among the high income countries for the first time last year, suggests that the trend is likely to continue. Now in Moldova, we think that there is a, a similar trend and we have seen uh, broad initiatives at state level to modernize particularly the road and rail national networks as well as the national airport infrastructure in the country. So against that background, and apologies, I was hoping not to have to deal with any technical glitches. So uh, against that background, we thought that it would be well-timed to discuss today a few topics, including why do so many projects end up in disputes, how to approach projects disputes in general, some specific issues when dealing with states or state-owned entities in the construction contract uh, context, and a few practical considerations when embarking on a new project, particularly in the, uh, the cross-border context. We want to conclude with a few specific aspects relevant to projects in Romania and in Moldova. And it is my distinct pleasure to be able to cover those topics today with my colleagues, 
uh, Noah Rubins, uh, Erin Miller Rankin, Gabriel Fusa, Amanda Neal, and Sorin Dole. And here they are. <laughs> uh, just by way of very quick introduction, um, how it is. NOAA um, is um, uh, the, the, a partner in our international arbitration group, and he has the inter heads the international arbitration group uh, in Paris. He also leads the firm CIS and Russia dispute resolution practice. He's an English QC, and he has acted in over 100 arbitrations globally under all major rules, including more than 30 investment treaty cases. He has served as arbitra arbitrator in more than 40 uh, cases, including on a number of investment treaty tribunals. He has published widely in the field of arbitration and is, is a frequent speaker at arbitration conferences across the globe. Erin is a global partner in, uh, at Freshfields and she advises on legal strategies and managing risks on major projects. She leads a team of specialist practitioners that work across the world supporting clients on their major capital projects with a focus on emerging markets. Erin has specific expertise of complex international arbitrations in the oil and gas, power, mining, and transportation sectors. She is the co-chair of the Project Execution Subcommittee of the International Bar Association, and she's also the, one of the co-editors of the Ultimate Guide to Dealing with Delay and Disruption Claims published uh, last year. Erin also sits as arbitrator in um, project-related disputes. Amanda, uh, she's a principal associate in our uh, dispute resolution practice based in Vienna. She specializes in international commercial and investment arbitration, focusing on energy, major projects, corporate and financial disputes. She leads large teams in complex multi-jurisdictional arbitrations under a wide variety of arbitration rules. Amanda also sits as an arbitrator um, in a variety of cases. Gabriel is an associate in Freshfields Arbitration Group in Paris. He specializes on disputes in the energy, mine, mining, and real estate sectors. And prior to joining Freshfields, Gabriel was an associate in the dispute resolution practice of one of the leading law firms in Romania. He is qualified in New York as well as in Romania. Last but certainly not least, Sorin um, is the managing ator at attorney at Dolaya and Company and co-founder of the Moldovan Arbitration Association. He is currently a PhD candidate in international law at Moldova State University, and he holds an LLM in International Dispute Settlement from Geneva Law School. He practiced arbitration in a number of arbitration hotspots, including Geneva, Vienna, and Frankfurt. He is qualified in the Republic of Moldova. So after these presentations, and just to kick things off, um, I would like to ask, um, Erin, uh, the million dollar question, which is why do so many projects end up in disputes? A cynical person might say lawyers. Um, <laughs> however, there are actual reasons uh, that you can tell. Uh, if we can go to the next slide. Um, so here are some of the key reasons. I mean, every project is different. Every project will have its own unique features. But here are the common things that I've seen in doing nothing but projects disputes for a number of years now. First is ambiguities in the contractual documentation. Now that can be for a number of reasons, either because you say something in the, the general conditions that doesn't align with the specific conditions or with the specifications. It can also be because the people working on the contract came from one legal tradition, say common law, but the contract is governed by another, such as civil law. So people are bringing to a contract what they think it means, which might be different from what it actually will mean when construed in accordance with the governing law. Uh, employer imposed changes in design or additional works uh, is another uh, issue and often that comes in in the form of design creep. So by making comments on drawings that go beyond comments, they're actually changes to what you're being required to do. Uh, unrealistic risk allocation uh, is another issue. Often you can get hyperactive uh, legal counsel who want to push all risk onto contractors. That will drive a dispute uh, more than actually protecting an employer. So having a risk allocation that reflects who is best able to manage it uh, or a, a difference in price uh, makes sense. 
failing to properly administer the contract. Uh, never ceases to amaze me how many contract managers you have who don't seem to have actually read the contract. If you haven't read it and you don't know what's required in terms of notifications or split of obligations, it's very hard to administer it. So we always recommend a very thorough uh, project kickoff involving all of the team who will be in charge of delivering the works in accordance with the contract so that people do have a sense of at least what the key points are. Uh, unforeseen ground conditions, uh, that is uh, always an issue and it's an issue, an issue globally, particularly affects uh, transportation networks and when you're building things that are first of a kind for an area. So if you're building a rail system somewhere that's never had rail, if you're you know, doing a first mining project and you don't know what lies beneath the surface, that could be an issue. Supply chain uh, difficulties has been one of the key hallmarks of the pandemic. Uh, in terms of uh, you know lockdowns and restrictions uh, happening at different times in different places, posing a multitude of issues for international projects where you can be doing a project uh, in the Middle East with a contractor from South America with kit being supplied from China. You have to look at where things are coming from all the time. We expect to see issues uh, in the future as a number of countries trying to pull out of the economic hardship caused by the pandemic increasingly insist on local supply chains, which may or not may not be up to the task and may result in a number of claims as they try and uh, reframe things with international contractors. So let's talk about the, the top uh, mistakes that contractors can make. Uh, not following the contract. That often uh, is concomitant with not reading the contract. So contracts you know, in construction tend to be fairly prescriptive around things like notices. Uh, when you have a project manager on site uh, who is trying to maintain a relationship and is banking on the goodwill that they have, they tend to just put the contract to the side. That usually doesn't work out in the end. Uh, overly optimistic schedules. So actually, you know, having a schedule where you've just cut links in order to make it fit in with whatever unreasonable demand you might be uh, faced with. One of the things that we uh, recommend is getting uh, a schedule actually reviewed, not just by the owner, uh, not just submitted by the contractor, but having an independent party look at it and see if it's actually workable as a schedule and if it can actually be analyzed. Um, because it doesn't help you to get into a dispute and say, well, this schedule is never going to work. You can't figure out where the delays were, where the true critical path was. Uh, unrealistically low profit margins at the outset that you know automatically tends to put uh, contractors into a claims mentality uh, which isn't helpful uh, notice huge huge thing and again this can be very cultural uh, you know if you if you start from the from the west like with the, the states uh, or even Canada I would say less so because I am Canadian um, it's a very litigious culture so it's common it's not viewed as something bad or harmful to be protecting your contractual rights by submitting uh, timely notice. If you go through uh, towards the, the Far East, it's much more of a face and a relationship and a harmony culture uh, where people don't want to do that because they don't want to set the wrong uh, tone and appear like they're going to be very claims oriented. I think it's, it's you know, fine and understandable to want to keep a relationship, but it's better if there's a, you know, a commitment made at the outset to administer the contract in accordance with its terms. Then failing to request the right type of decision or instruction in accordance with the contract. So not requiring a variation order if people are putting comments on your drawings that actually will amount to being a change. You need to call that out and say, well, we need a variation instruction. What you're asking us to do is change the contract. Could just go to the next slide. Um, failing to submit supporting documentation to requests for extension of time. Um, so obviously sometimes you have to notify uh, with documentation to follow. It's amazing how often people don't submit the particulars uh, when they have to. Uh, and then even the approach to submitting them, especially if you're dealing with uh, audited entities uh, such as you know, major international corporations, uh, or governments, you're going to have to submit some sort of substantiated documentation that makes sense and supports why you get an extension of time. So it has to show where the critical path was. It has to say what happened. It has to show why the consequence of that was because of the thing you are complaining of. Um, incorrectly valuing claims. So this can either go one way or another. Either people 
you know, we'll just look at, at one narrow part of a claim and forget big money items such as disruption caused by multiple changes. Uh, or they can just throw in a, a massive number, uh, you know, on a view that it will uh, settle things. And often it can just split things further apart. Um, acting on variations before you agree time and cost uh, is a significant problem. I mean, sometimes, obviously, you have to if there's some sort of an urgent situation. Uh, but you would want to make sure, even if uh, time and cost are not agreed right away, that there's a recognition that it is a variation and that they must be agreed and that your position is that there's going to be an impact. And with this, you have to take particular care if there's an engineer or an owner who consistently signs off and says, yes, it's a variation. And no matter what it is, even if it's, you know, change the whole structure, uh, we'll say no time impact. Uh, you need to always protest that and say that is not consistent with what we've what we've agreed and what we are saying, because often people will just robotically write that uh, on every variation. Mitigating uh, disruption and subcontractor delays as another one. Disruption can be really hard, um, almost as important as mitigating is properly documenting uh, disruption. But with subcontractors and when you're managing that find balance if you're a main contractor or even if you're stuck in between a main contractor and a sub sub contractor, you wanna make sure that you're saying consistent things. You shouldn't view the relationships as being watertight and that you would never be in a position in an arbitration where you would have to disclose documentation, such as if you're telling you know, the employer that it's all their fault and then you're also telling your subcontractor that it's all their fault. You could get caught out uh, in playing a game like that. Uh, design changes, which are, are coming in by stealth. Again, this is the design creep issue, comments on drawings. Uh, you should not be willing to act on changes that are not being introduced properly, which usually means in the form of a change order or a variation order, because that machinery is there to give you protection in terms of what you can claim flowing out of it. And Erin, do you, do you commonly see these issues across projects globally, or are some more specific to particular regions or perhaps particular cultures? I think where you where you tend to see it the most is where you have a combination of cultures, right? So if you have a contractor from the Far East working in the Far East, there's a general understanding of culturally what's expected. Similarly, you know, in America, if you have an American contractor working on a, a contract for an American employer, there's an understanding of how it works. How it can get a bit difficult is if you have international entities importing a view that it's going to be like it is at home uh, in other uh, contracts. And then you have things where, you know, situations evolve. So it used to be uh, the case in some regions where, you know, you would look at making it up on your next project. There was, you know, less scrutiny over governments. There was less scrutiny globally over issues of corruption. There's a lot more regulatory oversight on projects uh, now. I think that can make it more more difficult. And where you see that level of scrutiny, especially if there are, you know, World Bank or other multilateral funding agencies involved, if it's project finance, uh, you have to be a bit more prudent in terms of protecting your right. When other people can look in and decide, have a say in whether or not you get paid, you need to make sure that you've got all of your documents in order. And staying with you, Erin, what is your advice on how parties involved in projects should approach disputes when they arise, particularly in the when we we we, we move across cultures? <laughs> Other than calling good lawyers, uh, sure, <laughs> happy to do that. I mean, one of the one of the things about construction disputes is, yeah, you have a lot to do after the dispute arises, but your success in that is going to hinge in large part on what you do while the project is on foot. Are you getting your notices? Are you keeping records? Will you be able to show afterward where the crews were working, where the superintendents were, what was when something was supposed to show up versus when it actually did show up? Um, and your success once you are in a dispute is the importance of having a neutral dispute forum. So it can often be difficult if you're a you know a foreign entity and you're going into a host state court system that isn't yours. You may not understand it as well. Uh, and depending on the state, you may not necessarily get a fair hearing. 
Um, so you would normally want, uh, you know, neutral decision makers, ideally specialist decision makers. There are a lot of courts that will appoint experts. Um, so you could have, I've actually seen a case where um, there was a court appointed expert for a complex power plant. Um, and this expert had only ever uh, engineered uh, gardens in public parks. I mean, it was just completely different. He was an expert in building something, nothing like what the subject of the dispute was. Um, you're also going to want to look at the enforceability of awards, uh, including against states. So is it a New York convention uh, place or not? And a convenient venue. So you can have one kind of governing law, you can have a different procedural law, and you can have a totally different uh, venue. And I think sometimes that's not as well understood. So you should look at whether you are going against a government. Some governments um, have prohibitions against uh, agreeing to a, a foreign law or a foreign seat uh, for a dispute, or they might need a special approval for arbitration. You should check that to make sure that you have an enforceable uh, position. You have to look at whether you do have or want to have a, a long-term relationship, um, as well as whether you have any overlapping investment treaty uh, protection, because sometimes you may find that, uh, that with all the will in the world, you need to resort to that. And are there specific or more um, prominent dispute resolution options that you see in construction cases? Uh, often, if it's project financed, you see a UK law London seat. Uh, it just seems to be something that uh, project financiers understand and are, are quite comfortable with. So that uh, shows up a lot. Um, this slide shows the, the most common seats. So you have London, you have Paris, uh, Dubai and Singapore. Uh, yeah, rather than being a, a choice seat of everyone, I think Dubai is, has had a legacy position there due to just the sheer amount of construction and follow on disputes uh, that you've seen. But London and Paris are, are very popular. And if it's not uh, being driven by project finance, um, in my experience, it's often been driven by the legal tradition of the place that you are uh, doing the project in. So whether it has a common law tradition, people would lean more towards London, civil law uh, tradition would lead more towards uh, Paris. And Paris, of course, is always popular because it, uh, it was often the, uh, because of the ICC rules. Um, and in terms of rules, it's often ICC or LCIA. There are a number of other rules that are becoming increasingly popular, uh, SEAC, uh, rules, for example, in Singapore, Hong Kong rules are very good, AAA uh, in the States, but it's still predominantly ICC, LCIA. Uh, it seems every jurisdiction wants to get its own domestic uh, arbitration center. I'd be cautious about doing a dispute in a foreign country and necessarily agreeing to their uh, local local center. Uh, some of them are, are frankly not that, not that good. <laughs> And when you, most of those construction contracts, um, they have multi-tiered dispute resolution provisions that require all kinds of things to happen before one moves to arbitration. Uh, so what, what are your top tips on how to approach those? On how to approach multi-tier arbitrations? Yeah. Uh, well, by following what the contract says you have to in order to get to arbitration. So you need to send your notice, you need to have an amicable settlement period and document that, like send a letter saying, it was great to have that settlement, an amicable settlement talk today, it's too bad it didn't work out. Um, if you need to uh, get an engineer's determination or mediate as a precondition, then you have to do it. Certain uh, courts and national laws take a very strict approach. And even sometimes you can have a, a clash if, you need to get uh, interlocutory relief, for example, get an injunction to stop a bond call, but you haven't met your conditions. Um, you might have to find that you uh, stop, start and then hold uh, to, to cover that gap, but you will ultimately have to uh, follow those steps or else you'll face a jurisdictional objection. I would like to move now to uh, understanding a bit better how you go about um, choosing the tribunal and again this this theme of uh, being mindful of cultural differences and the, the tribunal dynamics um any given the, the specific feature or the, 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 the specific nature of con construction disputes are there any um criteria or things that you you recommend um, uh, parties to take into account where uh, when when selecting arbitrators 
Uh, well, I think diversity is important. Expertise uh, is important. Uh, efficiency is important, which is why I'm going to speak quickly, as I believe I'm over time. Um, but you would want to have a tribunal that's going to understand the issues the way that you meant them to be understood at the outset. So if you have, you know, a, a French party and a, and a Spanish party over a project that's governed by Italian law, I don't know why you would get three white guys who are QCs from England to to hear that dispute. You know, they may have a lot of ex industry experience, perhaps less in terms of the, the business culture uh, and the legal culture that would be applicable. Uh, so knowledge of the law, language skills, industry, um, availability, uh, and strong management, because there are so many issues in construction with the volume of paper and the number of witnesses that can be involved that you need people to keep a handle on things. Um, I know we are running soon shortly on time. Uh, I, I am. I, I did want to ask one one final question about um, um, about again cultural and cultural influences on, on the dynamics of the tribunal and what are in your view the, the areas where the, those cultural aspects can make a difference uh, when tribunals are hearing construction disputes? Well I think culturally especially tribunal members who are coming from a, a civil code uh, jurisdiction they will be much more inquisitorial uh, they will look into the dispute they will care much more about what the documents say rather than what any witnesses say they'll be more likely to appoint a tribunal appointed expert rather than having any time at all for any hired gun experts that you might want to uh, have. And there would be a, a propensity towards shorter uh, hearings, which would you know, be aligned with shorter court proceedings as opposed to common law where you know, it wouldn't seem unusual at all to have a three or four week uh, hearing uh, and much more emphasis placed on fact witnesses, although it'll be interesting to see if that changes now that they've done actual scientific reports on how fact witnesses apparently don't really remember much accurately at all. Okay. Erin, perhaps we can now uh, move to um, looking at how things may or may not be different when, when dealing with um, states or uh, state-owned entities. Um, and uh, I, I would like to cover this topic with, with, with Noah. Um, so perhaps we can achieve technically the switch of speakers. And thank you uh, for my extension of time. <laughs> <laughs> thank you, Erin, very much. Hello, everyone. Hi, Noah. Hello, Mate. Thank you for joining us. Um, so as I said, um, I would I would like to briefly cover with you uh, how things happen on what parties should be mindful of when in dealing with states or state-owned entities in the in the context of construction projects. And perhaps just to kick things off, um, um, we perhaps you can give us an overview of what would be the dispute resolution options for contractors when uh, dealing with states. Sure. And the the first thing to say or the first question to ask is why are we fo why do we focus at all on on states in relation to projects disputes um, and the answer is in some parts of the world for example in north america um, the great majority of disputes uh, uh, or projects are between private parties it's a private employer and a private contractor um, and a private subcontractor um, and all the way up the chain it's private to private to private um, in many places in the world, and this is not just the developing world or transition economies like Moldova and, and Romania, but in Western Europe as well, the state is a major uh, uh, employer. It's, it's a major orderer of, of construction projects. Um, and, and as a result, um, particularly the largest uh, projects, infrastructure projects, energy projects, and so on, um, have a state element to it. Often it's not the state itself, although the state is in the background providing the capital, uh, providing uh, various forms of support, um, and it's it's very often a, a state-owned corporation that's charged with uh, running, managing uh, the, uh, uh, the 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 project um, through the means of a private contractor. So. Um, and the, the question po now to the question posed, which is uh, where states are involved, um, 
what are the dispute resolution options and how are they different from a pri purely private to private situation? Well, for the most part, it's the same thing. That is to say, you have a you're always going to have a contract called a complex contract. Sometimes you'll have multiple contracts, but all of them uh, will typically include some form of dispute resolution clause. Now, where it's a cross-border contract, very often that dispute resolution clause will be for international arbitration. Uh, it may be for local courts or foreign courts, but of course, as a, a foreign private party, engaging with a state entity is particularly important to ensure that the contract does provide for an international neutral forum where expertise in the subject matter is guaranteed um, and where enforceability across borders and against sovereigns will be simplified and that is generally international arbitration so you will have i hope uh an arbitration clause uh, and therefore whatever uh, disputes arise out of or in relation to that contract should be subject uh, to uh, arbitration or in the worst case scenario, litigation in the national courts. However, where there is a significant state presence in the project, there may also be the possibility of a claim against the host state under an international investment protection treaty that binds the host state, that is to say the employer, whether directly or indirectly, uh, and the home state of the, of the contractor, of the private contractor. And of course, there is always the possibility of mediation. And, and I'm often asked, well, what about mediation and conciliation? Should we put a mediation clause in our contract? Should we uh, have a, a pre-arbitration mediation requirement? That's a whole seminar in itself. Uh, my experience is that particularly where state entities are involved, mediation is a very difficult thing to make work, particularly prior to the launching of formal arbitral process. The simple reason is that states are bound uh, by the budgets to which they're uh, to the, which they're bound, often they're adopted by democratic process through uh, parliamentary action. Um, and in order to uh, allocate money to pay for claims, there has to be a binding judgment. Just coming to a compromise because that's the right thing to do um, or in good faith or for the building of good relationships is sometimes um, not um, not good, not not productive. It's not possible, actually, practically, from the bureaucratic and democratic process. I once represented a state in a construction-related investment treaty dispute in Eastern Europe, uh, and um, we told the state uh, that there was exposure probably in the range of 10 million euros, and they might want to just reach out and settle for one. Uh, and the state, the state chancellor said to me, you've really ruined my day. I said, why? I'm offering you an inexpensive way out. He said, I'd rather have a 10 million euro award against me than to settle without one for 1 million euros. For precisely that reason, he said, I don't, I wouldn't be able to explain to parliament why they had to allocate the 1 million euros for, for the claim. Now, in the end, we actually got the whole thing dismissed. So in the end, he was right and I was wrong. <laughs> Uh, can we, can you explain a bit more how those um, uh, international investment protection treaties work? Right. Yes. Sure. Um, so investment protection treaties have been around for a very long time. They've been around since 1959, and since 1969, these treaties have tended to include uh, arbitration clauses in them, which constitute an open offer to arbitrate qualifying disputes with qualifying investors, even if there's no contract between the state and the investor. Um, these treaties were sort of a dead letter for a long time. Nobody knew about them, nobody used them. Uh, the very first case brought under one of these treaties came in 1987. Uh, and you can see from the, from the graph here uh, that the growth in litigation under these treaties has has grown has, is is exponential, uh, such that to, to today we know about over a thousand investment treaty arbitration cases. A thousand, right? many of them settle. There may be more of them we don't know about because some are confidential. But in any event, the way it works is quite simple. State A and State B 
uh, sign one of these bilateral treaties or they join into a multi multilateral treaty that provides for the same thing. That tree in that treaty, the state signatories agree to provide to qualifying investors and investments a certain uh, range of substantive protections. And the most important ones are things like no discrimination, no expropriation uh, without compensation, and fair and equitable treatment, whatever that means. We'll probably come on to it in due course. And if there's an alleged breach of one of those uh, substantive protections, a qualifying investor who has a qualifying investment can launch arbitration directly against the state to seek compensation for the damage resulting uh, from that breach. So if, if, we, if we were to put this in a, in a sort of in a diagrammatic uh, way, um, is it the case that we, you can have, say, a, a contractor coming from um, a third country like the UAE having a project in Romania? Um, and um, something or vice versa, a, a Romanian contractor invest, investing, for instance, in the United Arab Emirates and something goes wrong and based on a, 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 a treaty between Romania and the United Arab Emirates, one or the other may or may not have a claim against the other uh, government. Is that yeah, that's, that, that's a good summary. And it's important to remember that it goes both ways. And, uh, you know, the, the best example of this is the United States, which for a long time uh, was party to the, the, the most used investment treaty in the world at the time, which was the North American Free Trade Agreement, which linked Canada, Mexico and the United States. And of course, when it was signed in 1993, the American government never even once conceived of the possibility uh, that Canadian investors might sue the United States under these treaties. In fact, that happened again and again and again. In fact, my first investment treaty case that I was involved in was there were two in a row uh, against the United States of America. It was a big shock for them. But for, for you, uh, what it means is if you're a Moldovan investor or Romanian investor, uh, you should remember that uh, your outbound investments may well be covered by one of these treaties. It's not just about suing Moldova or suing Romania. And, and that, that, that is actually a very interesting uh, point, Noah, because it is true that in, in, uh, perhaps the original idea was to structure those treaties to allow um, uh, investors from, from developed countries to, to, to facilitate their investments in developing countries. Um, and, uh, and we saw in recent years a wave of claims from investors in developing countries suing some of the, uh, the, the natural developed countries, including in Europe. And that led to a, a, um, a sort of a public uh, damnation of the, the, the system implemented by those treaties, uh, which is all <laughs> quite fascinating, I think, it's including at the European level, which may be very relevant for Romania in the context of projects as well. So you've mentioned the number of, um, of protections available. Um, which ones do you think are uh, most relevant in the context of, uh, of construction projects? Or are there some that are more re relevant than others? Well, I think, I think um, the, the most relevant ones, for, first of all, uh, is fair and equitable treatment because it is so, uh, so general. Um, uh, I should say um, uh, the, my, one of my first investment treaty cases was against the Russian Federation involving the construction of the su new Supreme Court building in Moscow. Um, and there, one of the very important uh, protections was uh, full protection and security, because it was said that the Russians uh, had sent in uh, troops to eject the um, the investor from the Belgian investor from the project when uh, when it wanted to take over and that was said to be a violation of full protection and security um, but certainly uh, the observance of obligations uh, uh, a clause also known as an umbrella clause you can see the black arrow there is extremely important uh, for uh, project disputes and that's because unlike for uh, disputes that arise out of regulatory change, uh, which are probably the most common category of investment treaty disputes. In the projects context, you almost always have a, a substantial, well-drafted contract that has very specific obligations and rights of the parties. And so what the umbrella clause does 
ostensibly at least, is it elevates the national law obligations that are contained in the contract to the international level and allow for a treaty claim to be brought on essentially the same factual basis, roughly speaking. Um, there are other um, protections that are relevant in projects. Free transfer of returns, for example, is, is quite important because um, so often it's important that the the flows of capital be kept moving during the project in order to ensure the timely delivery of equipment and materials um, and where there are, for example, currency controls, uh, import controls, and so on, that can be um, a real problem. And also expropriation. Um, as I said, there is always a requirement that expropriation, uh, whether it be direct or indirect, be accompanied by full compensation. And uh, one can uh, easily characterize the wrongful termination of a construction contract as an expropriation indirectly of, um, of contractual rights. Perhaps one, I'm just mindful of time, uh, perhaps one uh, final question from me is, but is it possible to bring a treaty claim for a simple breach of contract? And if so, what are the main things that one should look at when trying to do so? So I think the, the easy answer is, um, yes, you can. Um, but it depends what kind of contract, with whom the contract is, and how it's how it's breached. So not all breaches of contract are going to form at least good treaty claims, um, and many in the past have been dismissed because they were just too con contractual, and they were not international enough. And so um, a, a lot of times, what you will have is contract and tr and treaty uh, arbitrations being conducted in parallel. And for example, we represented for many years the foreign investors in the peace pipeline between Egypt and Israel, um, which was um, a, a, a huge project that was designed to bring Egyptian gas to the Israeli market. And in 2011, the gas supply was stopped. Um, there was, of course, a gas supply agreement uh, that called for uh, Cairo arbitration, English law. Uh, but there was also treaty rights of the um, uh, of the uh, foreign shareholders in the company. They said that their interest in the company and in the project had been expropriated. And so we ended up with four arbitrations at the same time, two under contract and two under treaty. Um, now, how do you know if that's going to work or it's not going to work? Well, the first question is, um, what's the privity? That is to say, is the claimant company in the treaty arbitration, the investor is, is that, has he signed the contract or is he just a shareholder or another stakeholder uh, in the project such that uh, the, um, the investor would not have a direct right under the contract? Same thing goes for the state. Is the state a direct party to the contract or is it a state-owned entity that has signed it? And generally speaking, it's hard, it's hard to say you know, with, with any absolute certainty, but generally speaking, the less privity to the contract, the easier the claim gets. Because one, you know, the, the investor can easily say, um, you, you, you want to send me back to contractual arbitration, but I, I actually cannot sue the state except under the treaty. And what has happened to me is because of the state as such and not because of the state-owned company alone. And of course, um, you also need to look at the uh, dispute resolution clause in the contract. Could it be implied to exclude other um, rights of recourse? And, um, you know, uh, could it be interpreted to require the treaty tr tribunal to wait until the uh, contractual uh, forum actually rules whether there's been a breach of contract or not? Now, in most cases, in most cases where there's treaty claims and contract claims, there are additional problems that have arisen around the edges of the contract where other government agencies besides the one that signed the contract have interfered. They've raised taxes, they've changed the regulation, they've uh, created obstacles to timely performance. Um, they've done other things which may not actually be breaches of contract or they may be independently unfair or expropriatory um, in the use of state power aside from the 
direct contractual relationship between employer and uh, contractor. No, I think that 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 final point is can be the subject of a seminar of a lo day long seminar on its own. Um, but uh, uh, thank you so much for uh, for your uh, your insights into how all of this works. Um, what I would I would like to do now is move to um, uh, a few practical tips and practical considerations um, about or what, what to do when embarking on a new project, particularly in the context of cross-border projects. And Amanda, I know that uh, you have a few tips for us. So um, over to you. Thanks very Thank much, Matei. Uh, yes, exactly. Today I want to talk, tell you about some of the practical matters you need to be aware of when you are engaging in projects work, generally, actually. Um, so if there's one thing that arbitration lawyers know very well, it's that our clients, for the most part, really don't like being involved in disputes, which is totally understandable because disputes are, from a commercial perspective, a huge burden. But they are also, unfortunately, in some cases, inevitable. And Erin told us a little bit about that earlier today. Um, and that might be because an arbitration claim is brought against you and you have to defend yourself. And it may also be because arbitration is, in fact, the best way uh, for you to protect your interests. And so you commence arbitration proceedings as a claimant. Uh, but what a, a lot of people don't know, what a lot of our clients don't know, uh, is that the outcome of an arbitration can be significantly impacted by factors that arise well before the dispute itself arises. And if you have a good understanding of what these factors are, you can have a substantial positive impact on the course and sometimes even on the outcome of a dispute. So um, on the next slide, we have listed three things that you can do to influence the outcome of any dispute that might arise on your project, even before the dispute itself arises. First, you can ensure that you structure your project in a way which enables it to benefit from investment protection treaties in the manner that Noah has just explained. Uh, second, you can ensure that your contractual documentation contains all the provisions necessary to protect your interest to the fullest possible extent. And third, during the course of the project itself, you can put in place systems and processes which ensure that any future arbitration runs smoothly and to minimise nasty surprises. So turning to the first point, which is investment treaty structuring. Um, now, while you might think this is a very technical matter that requires specialist knowledge, making sure your project is protected under an investment protection treaty is, in fact, relatively straightforward once you know how. Um, now, remember, as Noah explained, you don't need to be entering into a contract with a state or a state-owned enterprise to benefit from the protections provided by investment protection treaties. Um, your contracts may be solely with other companies responsible for executing a project, but it's nevertheless prudent to structure your investment in a way which ensures that it is protected under an investment protection treaty, because this will give you the greatest chance of having a remedy in the event that your project is negatively impacted by state action. So in general terms, when engaging in investment treaty structuring, there are five key questions that you have to ask. The threshold question is, is there an investment protection treaty between your home state, that is the state your company is incorporated in, and the host state? Now, say for example, you're an Ita Italian company. Is there an investment protection treaty between Italy and Romania, or between Italy and Moldova for that matter? Um, Gabriel and Soren are going to talk about the investment protection treaties uh, Romania and Moldova are party to a little bit later, but spoiler alert, there isn't. So what do you do now? Um, now, because investment protection treaties apply not only to natural persons, but also to legal persons, this gives you an opportunity to engage in what's sometimes called treaty shopping. Now, provided you're not already in a dispute with a host state, this is generally speaking acceptable. Basically, treaty shopping involves reviewing all of the treaties which the host state is party to and figuring out which is the best one for your project and establishing a project company or vehicle in the relevant counterparty jurisdiction. 
Now, there are two very important, there are many important things to keep in mind, but two in particular when selecting your investment protection treaty. First, if your host state is in the European Union, for example, Romania, and your company is incorporated in the European Union too, you'd be well advised to choose a jurisdiction for your project company, which is outside of the EU. Um, and there are particular legal reasons for this relating to recent decisions of the European Court of Justice. Um, and the other thing to keep in mind is that investment treaty protection is, of course, uh, not the only thing to keep in mind when you're structuring a project. So be sure not to forget other factors like tax consequences when you're establishing companies in particular jurisdictions and deciding how to structure your project. Um, now, once you've identified which investment protection treaty you could rely on, you basically need to engage in a comparative exercise to determine which of them will you provide you with the highest and best level of protection and therefore where you should establish your company. Now, it's the relevant questions that you need to ask are listed up on, on the slide. Uh, first of all, will your project company qualify as an investor under the treaty? Now, one, there are, again, several things to be aware of, but one I'll mention in particular is that some treaties exclude mere shell companies from the definition of investor and they require the company to be doing real business in the relevant jurisdiction. The next question you need to ask yourself is, will the project qualify as an investment under the treaty? And one thing to keep in, be aware of here is that mere contracts for services or for money, they don't qualify as investments. You really need to be owning directly or indirectly some kind of asset such as shares in a company or real or movable property in the host state. After you've established that you, you are an investor and you have an investment, you have to consider which of the available treaties provides you with the highest level of protection. And finally, look at which treaty provides the best dispute resolution options. And generally, this will be treaties that provide direct access to uh, exit arbitration, investment arbitration, and without you having to go through the local courts first or waiting too long to commence proceedings. So, Amanda, if I may. Sure. You've mentioned this exercise and the key questions that one needs to answer. Um, when is, this, is, is, is the idea that that should all be done before uh, you set up a new project in a new jurisdiction, or is it acceptable to do it even um, throughout the life of a project, arguably before a dispute arises, for instance. Exactly. So the key thing here is to engage in this process before a dispute arises with the host state. Once the dispute has arisen or there is any hint of a dispute arising, it, it could be considered to be um, sort of an abusive process. But prior to that, and ideally when you're engaging in the project, uh, you can freely engage in this kind of structuring exercise to maximise your protection under investment protection treaties. Okay. So, so once you've structured your project, the next thing you need to do is negotiate strong protections into your contracts. And the threshold issue here is uh, to be aware of the impact of local law on key areas of the contract. Now, I'm not going to go into this in too much detail because it's going to be covered by Gabriel and Soren a little bit later. The key areas here are to consider statutory obligations on liability for defects, consider the interpretation and enforceability of liquidated damages clauses, to consider limitation of liability clauses and to consider termination provisions. Once you've gone through that process, there are a few other areas you give particular focus to and they are force majeure, stabilization clauses, sovereign immunity, and dispute resolution. And I'll just give you a brief summary of each of those, starting with the easiest, which is force majeure. It's um, relatively popular at the moment as a result of the pandemic. Briefly, a force majeure event is an unforeseen event which occurs um, outside the control of the parties and it excuses performance until the event passes. Now, the parties can define specific circumstances that they agree to treat as force majeure events, for example, a pandemic, and it's a very good idea, and we've learned that in the last year, to give careful consideration to what factors these will be and what the specific consequences are. Now, stabilisation clauses and uh, sovereign immunity are issues which affect contracts uh, with 
host states or with governments, as Noah has explained. Um, and a stabilization clause is a clause that addresses how future changes to laws and regulations in the host state will affect contractual rights and obligations of the investor. So it basically allocates risk associated with changes in law and regulation. Now, these kinds of clauses used to be very prevalent in investment agreements and in concession agreements, but states are increasingly less willing to accept them, and ultimately they'll be a matter of negotiation. The other thing to be aware of is that there are limits to what you can do with a stabilisation clause, especially in civil law jurisdictions. For example, you can't limit a state's power to ensure that they're protecting public health or, or security. And in some jurisdictions, they're not valid at all. So in other words, you can include them in your contract, but they might be of limited value. Um, and they, they may not protect against changes in legislation, but what they might do is impose on the state an obligation to act in good faith and give rise to an obligation to compensate in case of breach. Sovereign immunity is another important fact to consider. To consider. Um, it's a rule in international law which precludes the courts of a state from exercising jurisdiction over certain classes of cases in which a sovereign is a party. And the rationale is that states should be free to exercise their sovereign powers without undue influence. Um, it operates at two levels. First, it confers protection on the state from being sued in a particular forum. This is immunity from suit. And second, it offers protection from execution of awards against the assets of the state. That's immunity from um, execution. Now, as a general rule, sovereigns can waive both immunity from suit and immunity from execution. Um, most states will allow awards or judgments against a foreign sovereign to be executed against assets of the sovereign, sovereign in the jurisdiction that are used for commercial purposes. Um, and but special protection is usually provided for diplomatic property, embassy accounts, military assets and things of that nature. Um, and, and the other thing to be aware of is that generally, if a foreign government submits to the jurisdiction of an international tribunal through an arbitration agreement, that, that very often constitutes waiver from immunity from, from suit. The final factor that I wanted to, to raise in relation to contractual protections is that is dispute resolution clauses. Now, they're very important to get right. Um, Erin explained earlier the importance of having a neutral forum um, and, you know, having the relevant arbitrators with the relevant industry and uh, expertise, the legal expertise, and also the cultural understanding. Um, and, and special considerations need to be given to the nature of the counterparty in particular, whether it's a state authority. Here you need to be very careful about the interplay between contractual dispute resolution clauses and um, the dispute resolution provisions available under investment protection treaties. What you're really aiming for is for that dual protection, to have protection under the contract and to have protection under investment uh, protection treaty. And of course, if you are ever in doubt, then you should call your lawyers. Um, <laughs> and I just want one, one point uh, on, on that. Is it fair to say that from from the, those five circles, the stabilization clauses and sovereign immunity are particularly important when you're dealing with states, whereas the others are important across the board, even in pure private uh, contract relations? You're, you're absolutely right, Matei. So the, the clauses, the red and the purple clauses um, you can see there are very, very important when you're dealing with um, states, state-owned enterprises. As Noah mentioned earlier, this is extremely important in transition economies where the state still has a big, big role in things like building infrastructure um, and all sorts of projects related work. So, so those are th those to be given special consideration when your counterparty is a state or um, a state entity. I mean, I just, I just pause one second because I, I just remember that I forgot to, to mention one thing for the viewers at the outset. There is a, an ability to put questions in the form of comments, uh, which uh, we hopefully will be able to see and address. Um, uh, there is no other option for asking questions. We do uh, plan to have a few minutes at the end for, uh, to answer some of the questions or comments. Thank you, Amanda, sorry for breaking your flow. No, no problem at all. So, I mean, the, the final topic that I want to talk about today is uh, another important topic that Erin mentioned, which is what you can do 
during the course of your project to ensure that it runs smoothly and that any disputes uh, actually run uh, to the maximum extent possible in your favour. Now, the three factors to consider here are first, proper document management, second, discipline in creating documents, and third, effective preparation of claims, which basically means being aware when a dispute arises and being taking particular care to keep careful records. Um, now, one thing you'll notice is that all of these factors concern document management. Why are lawyers so keen on proper documentation? Well, from a lawyer's point of view, documents are evidence. And um, contemporaneous documents are, in fact, the best form of evidence. They are primary evidence. They're better than witness testimony and they're better than expert testimony in many cases. So documents are the best tool that a lawyer has to help you prove your case or to defend you. And your ability to support a claim may be greatly compromised if you don't have proper documentation. So documents, the other thing to be aware of is they're also the tool which can be used against you by your opponents. Um, most arbitrations have a process called document production where your opponent can ask you to hand over documents relevant to the dispute. And you may therefore have to provide your documents, including unfavorable documents, to the other side. Um, now, a failure to have maintained proper documents might actually result in a tribunal making adverse inferences, perhaps you know, the idea that you may have destroyed documents and they, they could lead to adverse findings against you. So the main takeaway here is that your document management system should be focused on creating good evidence for the future in case something goes wrong. Now, on the next slide, on the right hand side, we have a very handy list of do's and don'ts. Um, one important thing to keep in mind is that your hard copy documents should be scanned and kept as electronic files. The reason is that documents get lost and if they have not been contemporaneously scanned, properly archived, you might end up in a dispute five or ten years from now and you may not be able to find those documents anymore. Um, and that is a disaster for us lawyers. Uh, another factor to keep in mind is that you shouldn't use your personal email address for business purposes and in fact ideally shouldn't use text messages or WhatsApp for business purposes, but if you do, keep records of those messages. Uh, never destroy your documents. The reason for that is the one I mentioned before, that that might lead a tribunal to making an adverse finding against you. And always file your future evidence properly so that your lawyers can make the best use of it if you end up in a dispute. In a dispute. The very last point that I want to make today on the final slide is that um, this re results re relates to controlling the flow of documents. So the best way to think of this is that when you control the documents, you control the evidence and ultimately you have much better control over the dispute. But conversely, when you don't control the flow of documents, you weaken your position in any arbitration. We've listed some of these factors, the factors that contribute to poor document control on the slide. Um, they are failure to deal with issues promptly or in some cases even more. Failure to correct errors in documents, such as minutes of meetings or correspondence. And failure to create documents required by the contract in accordance with the contract. Also essential in controlling the flow of documents is to avoid creating bad documents. And this is because, as I told you, you may have to hand these documents to the other side. And the three top tips I want to leave you with in this regard are that you should always ensure that the necessary staff have read and understood the contract. Erin made the point earlier that she's always surprised how many people have never read the contract. Don't be that person. Make sure you understand what you've agreed to with the other side. Never create superfluous documents that are adverse to your position. And finally, stick to the facts. Don't create documents which contain user opinions and don't use emotive language in unit correspondence. Amanda, thank you. I will try to control um, at least the slides today. Uh, <laughs> While doing that, what I'd like to do is move now to a discussion of um, more specifically um, uh, the Romanian and the Moldovan market. Uh, and perhaps we will start with um, uh, Romania. Gabriel, um, how does all of this work in the context of, um, of the Romanian uh, construction sector? Thank you, Matei. Um, well, there are a couple of things to mention. 
And I think first we should begin with some general aspects about the arbitration framework in Romania. Um, and first of all, we should say that Romania does not have a standalone statute on arbitration like some jurisdictions, but nevertheless, uh, there is legislation on arbitration. The Civil Code of Procedure uh, has two separate sections, one on domestic arbitration and the other on international arbitration. And while Romania is not a model law jurisdiction in the sense that it hasn't formally adopted the unicentral model law on arbitration, the general principles are the same. And it's important to note that the section on international arbitration adopts a broad approach to arbitrability of disputes um, seated in Romania. And uh, there is also a provision uh, that expressly states that states and state-owned entities are not allowed to avail themselves of their own legislation to argue that the dispute is not arbitrable or they don't have capacity to participate in that arbitration dispute. It is also in the Civil Code of Procedure that we'll find the provisions, for example, on enforcement and recognition of foreign arbitral awards. And those provisions are similar but not identical uh, to those of the New York Convention on uh, enforcement and recognition of foreign awards, which actually brings me to the brings me to the second point on the slide. Um, and that is to say, Romania has been a party to the New York Convention since 1961. Moreover, Romania joined the ICSID Convention in 1975. And perhaps one last general point, which is potentially less known, uh, Romania also has domestic legislation on the stimulation of investments. And that domestic legislation contains a dispute resolution provision that offers investors the option between recourse to national courts, exit arbitration, as well as uncentral arbitration. So that would be the, the general arbitration framework. Um, moving on now to which arbitral institutions are preferred by Romanian parties or which sets of rules are used in contracts uh, to which Romanian parties uh, are part. Erin mentioned earlier that in the construction context, the, uh, the most used set of rules are the ICC rules. And as we can see on the screen, that is the, the preferred set of rules for Romanian parties as well. So from that perspective, it is consistent with the larger trend. Um, as we can see, based on ICC's statistics from 2019, which are the most recent ones available, uh, 19 out of 205 parties from the CE in 2019 were Romanian, which ranks, it, ranks Romania third um, among countries from the CE. Now, where Romanian parties depart in their preference for arbitral institutions is that the second most preferred institution seems to be the VIAC and not the LCIA, um, as is the general, the international trend. And that speaks to the importance of, of Vienna as an important regional business hub um, in, in the area. And at the VIAC, we have the statistics from 2020 we know that four out of 31 parties from CE, SE, CIS were Romanian. But more than that, you will see on the chart on the right-hand side of the screen, Romania ranked fourth in the overall, uh, by, by overall number of parties out of not just that region, but the VX entire caseload for 2020. Uh, if we can now then move to the Romanian arbitral institutions, the local institutions, uh, by far the um, the one that is most used is the Romanian Chamber of Commerce Court of International Commercial Arbitration, often abbreviated in English, the SICA. Uh, and it is becoming increasingly important perhaps in the construction sector. Um, and that is because as of January, 2018, um, the government issued a new model public procurement construction contract for works exceeding 5 million euros um, in value. And that contract contains a SICA dispute resolution provision. So this is a departure from the previous practice of uh, government entities, which would enter into such contracts that contained 
ICC dispute resolution provisions. And perhaps one, one thing to also note here is that the shift from ICC to SICA arbitration also coincided with a major update of the SICA arbitration rules, uh, which as you can see on the screen, they now contain a procedure for emergency arbitrator proceedings. Uh, they provide for expedited arbitration proceedings for small value claims and generally an improved framework for multi-party arbitrations, among other things. Now, there are two, there are also, there also are two other institutions to note. Uh, the Bucharest International Arbitration Court, which was recently founded under the auspices of the American Chamber of Commerce in Romania, as well as the Permanent Court of Arbitration of the Romanian German Chamber of Commerce and Industry. And if I can just mention one more aspect with regard to the SICA, it operates with a list of arbitrators. That said, parties are free to nominate arbitrators from outside the list as well. And the list contains many highly regarded national and international practitioners, including our colleague Matei. <laughs> Thank you, Gabriel. That's very kind. Um, uh, I, I guess, uh, do you have any statistics um, uh, regarding the, the, the use of the national arbitration institutions? Are, are they busy? Do you know what's their case law and are they dealing in practice with, uh, uh, with, with construction disputes? Well, Matei, let, let, let me start uh, backwards with the Permanent Court of International Arbitration of the Romanian German Chamber of Commerce and the, the BIAC, the Bucharest International Court. Um, I'm not aware of the statistics for these two institutions. Uh, as far as I'm aware, there are no statistics publicly available. Uh, that said, the, the BIAC, for example, was only very recently founded, so it wouldn't have had time uh, to have uh, a big case lo caseload at the moment. That doesn't mean that it won't have one in the future. Um, as regards the SICA, um, we do know that it, it, uh, construction disputes are a big part of the cases it administers. Uh, and while, while um, uh, I don't know, I haven't seen a f uh, official statistics as far as I'm aware, um, there are around 100 cases per year, 25% um, of which are international. And given this change in, leg in, the, in, change in the model of public procurement contract, uh, for construction works over five million in value, we can only assume that construction disputes will continue to play perhaps even a bigger role than they have so far at the SICA. Okay, thank you. Yeah, I think that, that that's probably right. And uh, as far as I know, I think you're, the, the, the numbers you've mentioned are probably consistent with, 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 with what I've seen in their practice. Okay, if we can then move to some substantive issues. Um, we have picked uh, six, what we called six key, area, key areas of which international contractors should be aware. Of course, these aren't the only ones. Uh, they're just the ones we picked for today's purposes. And they relate to liability for latent defects, liquidated damages, termination, first major, legality of stabil stabilization clauses, and waiver of sovereign immunity. Moving on to the first one, and that's liability for latent defects. Uh, for this one in particular, I think it is important to, to know the interplay between what you agreed in the contract and what the governing law of the contract says. Um, as Aaron and Amanda both said, it's very important to, to know what you have in your contract, uh, which is why here we've uh, provided a, a parallel between the 2017 FIDIC suite and what Romanian contract law says. Under the 2017 FIDIC suite, uh, there is a defects notification period, uh, which as the name suggests, is the period in which defects should be notified to the contractor. Uh, by default, this is 365 days long, but the parties are free to modify it. They can also extend it by at most two years. But once this uh, disputes notification period expires, or once the remedies um, are taken care of, the liability of the contractor persists. It's just the contractor will be liable for damages uh, and not would not have to actually remedy the defects. And this is where uh, national law comes into play because it is those limitation periods in the national law that will govern until when the contractor is liable. 
Um, there is an exception as well in, in, in uh, FIDIC uh, for defects relating to plant, but I won't get into the details uh, for that now. Uh, and I will move on to what Romanian contract law says. And under Romanian contract law, there is a general statutory guarantee period of three years, but parties are free to change this with one uh, particularly important exception in the construction, construction sector. And that is um, the law uh, regulating quality uh, in the construction sector provides that certain professionals, uh, such as the designer, the contractor, um, the, the supplier of materials, the engineer, they have to guarantee um, uh, their obligations for a period of 10 years from takeover, as opposed to the three year general period. And even more so with regard to structural defects, there is an obligation to guarantee under certain, certain circumstances for the entire lifetime of the construction. And only after these, well, n not necessarily only after these uh, guarantee periods uh, expire, uh, does the statute of limitation under Romanian contract law start to run? Uh, it can also start to run from the date of discovery of the defects if they are within the guarantee period. But if not, there is a backstop date, and that is the statute of limitation starts to run from the end of the guarantee period, and the defects must necessarily have occurred within that guarantee period. So that's about it with regard to liability for latent defects. Uh, we should perhaps now move to liquidated damages, uh, which are particularly important in the construction contract context uh, with relation to delay damages. Uh, this is pretty straightforward under Romanian law. Uh, liquidated damages provisions are permitted as long as a, a, a liquidated damages provision won't be enforced, however, if the obligation has become impossible uh, to fulfill and courts and tribunals will generally not interfere to reduce the amount of the liquidated damages provision, um, except if the underlying obligation was partially performed in a way that is beneficial to the obligee, or if the amount is manifestly excessive. Uh, perhaps one thing to note that's interesting here is that courts and tribunals under Romanian law cannot interfere to increase the amount. Um, although, for example, under French law, from which I believe the provision was inspired, uh, that is a possibility. And of course, or perhaps not of course, uh, parties are not allowed under Romanian law to claim more than the amount provided for in the liquidated damages provision. Moving on to the issue of contract termination. Again, it's very important to know what the contract states. Uh, here, it's generally going to be, uh, you're generally gonna look at the grounds for termination provided in the contract itself. And under the 2017 FIDIC suite, there are a lot of grounds, uh, uh, both for termination by the employer for contractor default and uh, termination by the employer for convenience or termination by the contractor for employer default, for example. And I will not get into the details of those now. Uh, perhaps one, one, one to, um, to mention is the termination by the employer for convenience, which you don't have under general Romanian contract law. And also another thing to mention with regard to this um, form of termination is that the 2017 FIDIC suite of contracts introduced a provision uh, that entitles the contractor to claim for loss of profits uh, when termination for convenience occurs. And then under Romanian contract law, again, it's pretty straightforward. Uh, you have the, poss the employer has the possibility to terminate for contractor default um, when, it, when it's impossible to observe takeover deadlines, when work is not carried out as agreed, or when there's a breach of other obligations under contract or statute. The contractor itself can also terminate for employer default. Uh, for example, when the employer agrees to provide certain materials or to obtain certain licenses and does not do so. And then there's also a termination for impossibility to perform. Um, but, and that, that depends on the extent of the, on the degree of the impossibility. It can either occur automatically or at the request of the obligee. If we can move to the next slide, uh, 
you know, just three points that are important uh, and that Amanda also touched on and uh, that contractors have to keep in mind. Under Romanian law, force majeure is, is recognized and regulated. It is defined as an external event that is unforeseeable, absolutely invincible and inevitable. Um, also interesting is that you have another um, uh, uh, possible ground for uh, non-performance, which is called an unforeseeable event or a cause for tweet in Romanian, which um, has similar effects, but does not require events as destructive as those required under force majeure, for example. In terms of legality of stabilization clauses, which were also mentioned by Amanda, uh, they are permitted under Romanian law. And in fact, the constitutional court stated in a decision last year that they are widely used in practice. Uh, and we know that they are widely used in practice. And in certain sectors, there are legislative provisions that act as function as stabilization clauses, although they are not stabilization clauses in a contract, but have the same effects. And with relation to waiver of sovereign immunity, um, there is no regulation on waiver of sovereign immunity in Romania. Uh, Romania is a party to the UN Convention or will be a party once it comes into force to the UN Convention on jurisdictional immunities of states and their property, but that convention has not yet come into force. That said, it is still important to negotiate um, waiver of sovereign immunity clauses because, for example, if um, a contractor is contracting with a Romanian state-owned entity, then this will come into play if that contractor, after obtaining an award, then tries to enforce in other jurisdictions where there, there may likely be a regulation on sovereign immunity and a waiver is required. And in, and in fact, that's something at, at Fresh Fields, we frequently assist clients at the enforcement stage, um, including with regard to asset tracing, teaming up with intelligence firms to identify assets in which um, uh, state-owned entities or any parties have, in which jurisdictions they have assets. Uh, Gabriel, perhaps very quickly, um, is there, does Romania have uh, um, a lot of BITs and is, are they used in practice, um, um, including in the project sphere? Well, Mate, yes, uh, Romania does have a fair number of BITs, I would say. Um, I, currently, there are 76 in force. Um, as per data available on uh, the United Nation Nations Commission's on uh, trade website, um, some of this have been have been used for uh, construction for projects disputes, as we know, and we will come to that in a bit. Um, in addition to Romania's BITs, Romania is also a party to the Energy Charter Treaty, which, as we know also provides for investment arbitration and Romania has been a party since 1998. Uh, you will see that some of these are colored in yellow on the screen and those are intra-EU BITs. Um, Amanda touched uh, on the fact that um, there have been several developments uh, which uh, would suggest that it's, it's better to structure your investment to be able to avail yourself of a BIT other than an intra-EU BIT. Uh, short, just just briefly, these are probably will be terminated soon. Uh, Rom Romania has taken steps to approve the process to start terminating its intra-EU BITs. And most of the EU countries have, have also signed a treaty um, terminating the intra-EU BITs between them once it is ratified. Gabriel, just being aware of time, uh, I think, why don't we move now to, to see how things stand in, in, in Moldova? Um, uh, and perhaps uh, Sorin can assist us with a, the general overview of, of how the Moldovan um, arbitration framework and uh, the construction um, sector looks like or look like. Gabriel, thank you so much. Thank you, Mate. All right, Sorin, can we see Sorin?
perhaps not. Well, I, I will, I will uh, use this opportunity then to just speak very quickly on uh, a, a question that we received by, uh, not through the comments, by, by through email. Um, and the, the question is, are there any examples of claims by investors from Romania or Moldova against other states under investment protection treaties? Uh, that's actually a very good question. Um, uh, I think the, the short answer is yes. Uh, as far as I am aware, there is one. Interestingly enough, it is by a dual Moldovan-Romanian national, so again, very on point for today's presentation, and in relation to uh, a project. So it's, it's a claim under the Energy Charter Treaty brought against uh, Kazakhstan um, by, as I said, dual Romanian uh, Moldovan nationals, um, and it relates to an oil and gas project in Kazakhstan. Now, we have, we, we have Sorin, so maybe we can <laughs> jump to Sorin and to an overview of how things uh, look in Moldova. Thanks, Martin. Hello, everyone. <clears throat> so, besides the common claim on the investment arbitration, we have many common features with Romanian legal framework. But what is different, though, uh, is that Moldova is a model law jurisdiction. So, in Moldova, the lex arbitrary is a loan arbitration and the law international commercial arbitration, which are applicable to all arbitra arbitrations seated in Moldova. Um, of course, there are other provisions from other laws, such as civil code of procedure, uh, you know, labor code, loan competition, which are also relevant for uh, arbitrations. Mm. Uh, Moldova is uh, party to New York Convention since 1998 and a party to Exit Convention since 2011. Now, moving to arbitrability, even though Moldova is a model law country, there are some features regarding the arbitrability of construction related disputes, which we can see on the next slide. So generally, all the construction related disputes are arbitrable, except uh, disputes related to residential real estate, including rental of residential properties, disputes concerning public relationship, no disputes related to the disposal of public, public property, except the disputes arising out of for any form of public or private partnerships. And lastly, the disputes with foreign element concerning the right of ownership of our real estate located in Moldova fall under exclusive competence of Moldovan courts. Now, talking about briefly, uh, talking briefly about main arbitral institutions, uh, in Moldova there are many arbitral institutions, but two of them are the most active. The first one is Chisinau International Court of Commercial Arbitration, which you now it was founded three years ago, uh, four years ago almost. Um, it has more sophisticated rules, such as emergency arbitrator, expedited procedure. On the other side, the International Commercial Arbitration Court under the Chamber of Commerce and Industry is the oldest one in Moldova. It has more than 70 arbitrators on the list. It is, you know, it has more experience, and uh, for instance, in 2020, uh, there were 128 cases under its administration. So the arbitration users in Moldova have some decent options in terms of arbitral institutions. Now, moving to key areas uh, where Moldovan law may, may affect the contracts, um, there are six key areas, key areas, starting with liability for latent defects. Now, in Moldova, the general guarantee period for liability of latent defects, which we can see on the next slide, is five years from the handover uh, of the construction. Um, so the contractor is liable for latent defects discovered within the five years period. Additionally, uh, the statute of limitation for latent defects is three years from the date when the latent defect is discovered or should have been discovered. Now, moving to availability of liquidated damages, the provisions are quite similar as in Romania, so we will not stop here too much. And we will move to the third aspect, which is contract termination. So, under Moldovan law, both uh, contractor and, of course, employer has have the right to terminate on particular grounds. Um, 
all, even though the contractor has the right to terminate um, uh, you know, on, on various basis, for instance, employer does not replace the unusable or unqualified material, or employer does not change the instructions regarding the execution of construction. Well, there are a few grounds which we can see in the civil code and the particular uh, laws where there's governed the rights and obligations of both parties. Now, the interesting part, which is the last three key, key areas, stabilization clauses, force majeure, and waiver of sovereign immunity. Stabilization clauses uh, are not express, expressly recognized and governed by Moldovan law. Uh, however, certain laws contain guarantees for investors which have the effect of stabilization clauses. Now, these provisions basically freeze the state's policy uh, applicable to a particular industry. You know, one of the examples is renewable sector, where according to the law on renewables, the state guarantees fed in tariffs for a particular period of time. Now, moving to force majeure, it is uh, regulated and permitted under, under Moldovan law, but unlike in Romania, the force majeure is merged with so-called casual fortuit under the single concept named excuse due to an impediment. So Moldovan lawmaker was inspired from Unidra principles and Article 79 of the CSG, um, and this concept is quite common in international commerce. Now, talking about waiver sovereign immunity, well, Moldova does not have any particular regulation and is not a party to UN Convention on Jurisdictional Immunities. On the other side, Moldova is a party to Vienna Convention on Diplomatic Relations, which governs the immunity of diplomatic assets. Now, <clears throat> turning to international investment protection, so Moldova is a party to 45 bilateral investment treaties, out of which 39 are in force. Additionally, investors need to be aware that only nine bilateral investment treaties contain umbrella clauses discussed, discussed previously. Um, up to date, Moldova was involved in, has been involved in 12 investment arbitration cases. 11 are concluded and one is pending. Out of, we, out of these 12 cases, two cases concern uh, or are um, related to construction projects. The first case is, which is still pending, is Comac Savia and concerns a dispute under a concession agreement under which the investor has the obligation of reconstruction of Kishinev Airport. The second one is Arif against Moldova, which is the first case involving our country, concerning a uh, construction and operation of a number of duty free stores by investor. Now, there is one particular aspect which is relevant specifically to Moldova, uh, related to territorial scope. Now, naturally, all bilateral investment treaties require the investors to make their investments in the territory of the host country. Now, an important matter that investors might want to learn is whether the investments made in a particular territory of Moldova, which is, which is a region called Transnistria, are protected by the international investment agreements concluded by Moldova. Most of the BATs concluded uh, by our country define the territory as a land over which the state exercises jurisdiction or sovereign rights according to international and national laws. So under international and national laws, Transnistria is a part of Moldova. However, on the ratification of the exit convention in 2011, Moldova notified the World Bank that the Convention applies only on the territory effectively controlled by the authorities of Moldova. Now, <clears throat> whether Moldova exercises jurisdiction over trust history is still discussable. Although there is no case law in investment arbitration discussing the status of this region, in some cases, the European Court of Human Rights found that Moldova does not exercise effective control of the territory in Transnistria, and it does not exercise uh, the authority over that region. So, the foreign investors, when investing in this uh, area, might want to, to be cautious and to do a little bit of research in order to determine whether and to which degree the investment treaties concluded by Moldova can protect those investments. 
I guess having said that, uh, I'll pass the floor to Matei. Sorry, thank you so much. Uh, that was uh, very helpful. Um, I think I'm conscious that we are running out of time, so perhaps we can deal with a, a few of the questions that we've received. Um, one, I think, um, is probably for you, Sorin, which is, uh, are there any uh, specific national laws covering foreign investments and foreign investment protection in Moldova? Mm -hmm. Well, there is a law actually enforced since 2004 called Law on uh, Investments in Entrepreneurial, Entrepreneurial Activity, which, uh, you know, it has some standards of protection like guarantees against unlawful expropriation or FAT or um, standards similar to bilateral investment treaties. But that law, so the ISDS um, clause in that law provides that the disputes between investors and the host state will be settled by the local courts or by arbitration after the dispute has been ar has arisen. So even though the law exists, uh, up to today um, I'm not aware of any investor relying only on that law when you know, searching for opportunities uh, to protect their investments. Um, and a final question uh, is, what are what areas substantively are most different and relevant between civil law and common law relevant to um, construction? Uh, I'm happy to deal with that quickly. That's a that's a very broad question. I think the starting point probably is um, contractor in particular or international contractor should be aware that in civil law countries you do have quite a bit. Uh, regulated by uh, the civil code and that's in a way that's your starting point um, so there are specific areas uh, such as uh, specific performance for instance which um, uh, uh, both Sorin and uh, Gabriel touched upon that, that operate differently and that's why there is perhaps a, a disparity between what the FIDIC form of contractors of, of, of contracts provide in terms of a defects notification period and the general way in which uh, Romanian law and Moldovan law, both civil law countries, um, uh, approach the issue of, uh, of defects and liability for defects. Other areas are force majeure, which again is something that is regulated in civil law countries, including Romania and Moldova, as Sorin and Gabriel mentioned. Um, uh, the way good faith operates um, and what is expected of the parties in terms of contractual performance, uh, as well as um, a specific statutory termination rights that uh, exist under the civil code and can operate in addition to um, what parties agreed in the contracts, um, as well as um, uh, um, the, the role and admissibility, for instance, of pre-contract negotiation. So those are just a few areas that I think are relevant. Um, did you, to, as I was just away for a second, Matei, did you mention good faith? Uh, very briefly, Noah, just as a general concept. <laughs> I, I think it's just one 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 area that many people um, who come from other legal traditions find surprising in the English law, um, which does apply to many, many contracts around the world, uh, is that good faith plays a rather minimal role in contractual relationships. That, that may be a little bit of an understatement, actually. Uh, it is the very rare case where uh, an international tribunal or a court will find there to be a duty of good faith where one is not designated in the contract. It may sound strange to, to you even to think of putting a good faith obligation in a contract, like, well, of course, because the Article 1 of most civil codes in civil law countries is the parties will carry out their obligations under a contract in good faith. That does not exist as a background matter in English law. And so if you really need there to be uh, such a an obligation of good faith dealing, uh, you'll want to include that in your contract if English law um, is 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 applicable and uh, English will, will uphold such a uh, such a provision. That is to say, if it's in there, then it's an obligation of the contract. If it's not in there, then it's not. All right. Well, with that, I would like to first thank. Erin, uh, Noah, Amanda, uh, Gabrielle, and Sorin for 
uh, for uh, their their contributions today and a, a really a, a really insightful discussion. Um, and then uh, also to Juridice Moldova and Juridice Romania, Romania, sorry, um, for uh, for organizing and uh, taking care of all the technical aspects of, of this webinar. Uh, and, and, and of course, thank you. By, by the way, Matei, we, we've, got, we've got five minutes and there are two questions that have just now come up from uh, people from the floor. So maybe we address those. Oh, sorry. Um, uh, yes. Um, so the, 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 four, the first that I see comes from Smaranda Miron. Um, is mediation before arbitration happening in practice in Moldova and Romania? Or would you say the tendency is to go straight before arbitrators? Maybe, <laughs> yeah, maybe Sorin has, has a sense in Moldova what the practice is. You're on mute, Sorin. So, Mate, can you briefly uh, restate the question, please? Sure. Is mediation before arbitration happening in practice in Moldova and Romania? Or well, you yeah. yeah. In a lot of mediation is, is practiced more in non commercial disputes, although, I mean, in the recent years, these practices have been. Um, you know, promoted. Um, so, I mean, in practice, it happens, but not as much as we would like to, to be. Gabriel, any any thoughts on on, on how that compares to what's going on in in Romania? I think the situation is somewhat similar, and perhaps you have some ideas here as well, Mate. But um, there was, uh, as far as uh, I remember, there was a trend at some point a few years back uh, to promote mediation, and but I think in recent years that that has toned down a bit. Um, so perhaps, perhaps parties still tend to go uh, to arbitration more than to mediation, and then arbitration or, or only mediation. Although there was a push. Uh, to promote mediation at some point a few years back. I, I, I think that, that that's right. And I think one also needs to look at what contracts such as FIDIC, for instance, provide in terms of multi-tiered uh, uh, resolution clauses, you know, um, where although not formally mediation, you have a variety of ADR uh, systems and me mechanisms that should happen before you go to arbitration. Um, the other question, uh, is what are states doing um, to protect against an increase in dispute settlements? Is there a trend to negotiate or terminate BITs by states? So I'm, I'm happy to take that in the first instance. Yeah, I, I think the, the, the most uh, important thing that's happening is that states around the world are changing the terms of investment treaties. They are narrowing their scope. They're uh, imposing um, certain limitations on the substantive uh, protections. Uh, they're putting uh, footnotes and glosses and explanations that are supposed to exclude the outliers that are supposed to make uh, really only the, mo the most serious disputes go to arbitration. Now, there are some places in the world where states are also terminating BITs, both unilaterally and bilaterally. Most importantly, the European Union has now insisted that all of its members terminate all of the treaties between them. But there are other states that are doing it unilaterally, particularly places like Venezuela and Ecuador, um, who have been the subject of many, many, many investment treaty cases. But that's really the outlying uh, area. I think there's a general sense that um, investment treaties are important to investment flows. Everybody wants investment flows, but they, there's a desire to uh, reduce the number of disputes and particularly the number of disputes, disputes for example, that deal with health issues, uh, public emergencies and, and these sorts of things. I, I think I would add to that, Noah, the case of India, which uh, I think a few years back had a similar uh, wide ranging initiative to to terminate its BITs and negotiate new ones on a new model. Uh, I, don't, I don't think that went very far, but a, a large majority of BITs uh, that India signed uh, were put to an end. Okay. Well, thank you again, everyone. Thank you, Juridice, and thank you all the viewers who uh, watched us. We hope that you found the, uh, the discussions um, uh, useful and helpful, and have a nice evening. Goodbye. Thank you.